done so to make a point about safety, of course, but upon reflection, perhaps a word of caution to Beowulf might have served just as well. For when the windows were open, the children had been happily engaged in educational pursuits. Beowulf was bird-watching, Alexander was navigating, and Cassiopeia had been making colourful threats against unseen pirates, which was good exercise for the imagination, not to mention the girls' rapidly growing vocabulary. I'll fillet you like a mackerel, <laughs> had been one of the choicer examples. But now the three incorrigible children were cross and at loose ends, a dangerous combination that could easily tempt any young person to misbehave, never mind three siblings who had been raised in a forest by wolves and were thus especially prone to mischief. There was a tap, tap, tapping at the window, it was Natsuwu, the bold and beady-eyed squirrel whom the children had improbably made into a pet. The furry scamp lived outside in the trees, as any sensible squirrel should, but he had become so tame that he often scurried along a low-hanging branch and made the heroic leap to the windowsill, whereupon Cassiopeia would spoil him with treats and try to teach him to do simple arithmetic with the acorns she had saved expressly for that purpose. Now the bewildered rodent could do nothing but press his nose against the glass and knock with his tiny monkey-like paws as his bushy tail flicked to and fro with anxiety. No one dared get up to open the window, of course, but the reproachful sound could not be ignored. There it was, the tap-tap-tapping of a single sad-eyed snack-seeking squirrel. If you have ever sniffed at a spout of a carton of milk to judge whether the contents were drinkable, and then found yourself wondering if milk actually goes from fresh to sour all at once in a great curdling swoop, or whether it turns bit by bit in little souring steps, and if so, at what point along the way the sourness would become evident to the human nose, and whether it might not be wiser to have a glass of lemonade instead, then you will have some idea of Penelope's current predicament. By now, she understood that the mood in the nursery had begun to curdle, so to speak, and that the cause had something to do with her shutting of the windows. However, she was not exactly sure how things had gone so wrong so quickly, nor did she know if the morning was already ruined or if there was yet hope of turning things round. She frowned and drummed her fingers on the cover of her book. It was not quite a year since she had become governess to the incorrigibles. All three of the children had made remarkable strides regarding their own educations, yet there were many times that their governess felt she was still figuring things out on the fly, so to speak. This was one of those times. Would anyone like to be quizzed on Latin verbs? she asked half-heartedly. The children shook their heads and sighed. Beowulf had given up building towers and was now gnawing on the blocks. Alexander idly poked his sister with the sextant, and Cassiopeia clutched her abacus in a way that suggested it might soon be hurled across the room. What shall I do? Penelope thought, for she recognized a looming disaster when she saw one. Should I reopen the windows and risk appearing foolish, as I have only just closed them, or should I leave them shut and try to jolly up the children some other way? Perhaps they would like me to read to them. But then she felt a sharp pang of guilt, for Penelope knew that the reason she had taken her eyes off Beowulf to begin with was that she had reached a particularly exciting part of the very book she now held in her hands, and, as a result, had temporarily forgotten, just for a moment, of course, that she was a governess in a nursery at all. The volume in question was one of the Giddy Up Rainbow series that Penelope was so fond of. In it, the tale's heroine, Edith Ann Pevington, enters her trusty pony, Rainbow, in a pony and rider show. Once there, a comical mix-up involving look-alike saddles causes Edith Ann to meet a boy named Albert, who also plans to take part in the show. His chestnut pony, Starburst, is as spirited and high-strung as Rainbow is gentle and sweet. The confusion about the saddles is quickly settled, but the encounter with Albert leaves Edith Ann flummoxed and unable to do anything but braid and re-braid Rainbow's already perfectly groomed mane and tail, if only to keep her mind off this distracting new acquaintance. Rainbow in Ribbons was the title of the book, and the pony show was the centerpiece of the plot, but this sideline business with Albert had captured Penelope's imagination in a way that made the book strangely difficult to put down.